so as you look at your design teams, as I do, there's inherently a make-buy trade-off that has to be made and has to be made very adroitly. Because when you choose to invest in developing some IP um, and you decide correctly, you can differentiate the products. If you decide incorrectly and you have poor quality IP or you make a mistake, or as one of our customers came and told me, he said, well, you know, Ron Black, your company, uh, Rambus, is a bit painful. Um, they are a little more expensive than I want. On the other hand, the IP that you produce always works, and the uh, particular group that I went to was a very low-cost IP. Uh, it didn't work. So technically, it only cost a dollar, but they forgot to tell me that there is five more dollars behind it, an extra year and a half on the schedule, which basically killed the entire project that we were working on. So, so choosing the IP is going to be incredibly important going forward. And I, quite candidly, I think this bodes well for India. It bodes well for Krishna, the team that we have here developing the IP. Um, it bodes well for our company. I think it bodes well for many of the companies out there. But this is an even more important chart. And if there's only one uh, uh, that I want you to remember when I leave, it's this one. Uh, it's not our data, so uh, I'm, you know, rest assured this is not me trying to invent something and twist it or contort it in some type of economic way. But the projection of the reuse of the IP is on the right-hand side. As you can see by 2016, they're saying 75% of the blocks that are used in here are going to be reused from previous instantiations. Now, obviously, this is economically driven, and it's, it's quite candidly the most important trend that I could imagine, which means when there's a high-quality IP block, when you've divine, designed it into a particular uh, fab at a particular uh, uh, technology node, why change it, especially if it's a critical block that's there? So I believe that the IP that we make collectively as an industry is going to be increasingly important, and companies that license IP, this is self-serving, part of the economic story, are, is going to, are going to be more important in the ecosystem. And it's going to be incumbent upon the, the IP companies to provide the absolute highest quality IP. Because if you make a mistake here, and you, uh, and you have to redo an entire mask set, again, it's not a $250,000 expense, it's a $10 million expense in the future. So there is an absolute necessity for IP reuse. Uh, I've been in many industries, like in the handset industry, and, um, or, or wireless machine-to-machine -machine, uh, impl uh, implementations, and it was staggering to me how many companies were redoing technology that was done effectively or better than other companies. And as, as an economist, if you step back and you look at the value add or lack of value add to the economy, it's staggering. Why would a company want to repeat something with the engineers that could do something else more effectively, an enormous opportunity cost, when it's already been done effectively? And that uh, competition, that internal competition, the way that industries get structured to compete on things when there's not an economic advantage, really just slows an entire industry uh, uh, down. So sorting out where the IP comes from, where it's best developed, how is it developed at the highest quality and the lowest cost, is going to be increasingly important. So. As we look at our company, we actually do a variety of things, including um, uh, uh, LED-based uh, optical waveguide technology. But the core of the company always has been, and, and I project will be for the foreseeable future, in the, the semiconductor business. So we count ourselves amongst the, the IP and tools grouping. And we are very proud of the high-speed I.O. that we produce as, and also some of the security products, and I'll glance at those. But I look at us as being part of this core and developing IP segment of the industry. And I think that we have to add a lot of new companies to this. These are the bigger companies, mostly U.S.-based, that, that I know of. And I think that this, in, this portion of the industry is going to continue to grow rather significantly for the reasons that I just described. So let me just give you a couple. This is the commercial on Rambus for those of you who don't know the company. Uh, our history has traditionally been in the high-speed memory I.O. space or links, so chip-to-chip -chip interfaces, uh, serial links. 
And the company has, uh, a, a, quite candidly, sometimes a mixed history because of uh, the a litigation that we've been involved in. I'm very proud to say that we've solved and settled almost all of the litigation uh, that's outstanding. Most notably, we uh, uh, Hynix took a license from us for uh, 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 $240 million over five years, so very significant uh, to our business. And we're looking past that litigation and working very, very hard to collaborate broadly with the industry. And what we launched in the memory and link space is something we refer to as R+, so RAM Plus, Plus technology. In the past, we attempted to serve the industry through creating more proprietary instantiations that were very challenging to get deployed for an economic basis. We made some economic errors because it was very challenging to get all of the DRAM companies to support it and have all of the controller companies also support it so that the system companies would actually implement it even if it was the best ta uh, technology. So unfortunately the economic underpinnings of the industry and the challenges to align the industry were, were, were very hard. And so we've, we've gone down a different route most recently. And this route is more akin to backwards compatibility. Being a processor guy, you never give up your code base. You always evolve the microprocessor so that the code always runs. You can have a compiler that takes into account of new advances in the processor over time, but, but you never give it up. And that's what we've done here. So in the, the low power DDR3 technology, we have instantiated what it looks to be a set of advances that can be used that are more along the lines of DDR4 and we're pricing it very competitively in the industry, something that we didn't always do before, trying to make it economically attractive for the parties to adopt it. But it's basically a standards compliant totally, very small cost additions, almost nothing, no test additions. And through the use of some of the novel technologies that will ultimately, we believe, be in DDR4, you can get significant performance or power improvement. So we target the server cloud type applications as as well as the mobile applications. And just to give you a, a tidbit, when we were looking at it from a systems level in mobile, we have implemented the full R plus uh, uh, offerings that we have. It improves the, the power consumption by about 25 to 30 percent in the DRAMs. And when you look at it from a duty cycle standpoint on the processors, that translates into a five, about 5 percent performance or uh, benefit in battery life. So 5 percent coming at having designed handsets for a living or had teams that did it, 5 percent in battery life is enormous, right? It, it, it's very hard to get that. So some of the advancements that we're looking at are, are a little bit different uh, economically the way we've approached the industry and, and we're quite proud of it. So uh, this is something that we think will start to be adopted and we were already in deep discussions with several companies. Uh, the second is DPA technology and cryptographic cores. Uh, DPA technology is often referred to, these are countermeasures, it's often uh, referred to as side uh, channel attacks. And this is basically where DIDT noise that exists in the system actually can leak information. So if you're rather in tuned and you look at the different encryption or decryption algorithms, um, simply by identifying, you know, say radiation from a device, you can look when the, the encryption or decryption is occurring and what goes on in between there is of course the exchange of the secret keys and the most egregiously uh, leaking systems, we can rip a key out uh, just by pointing an antenna and hooking it up to a high school oscilloscope. So it's either rather easy to do, um, very hard to protect against. Uh, the entire smart card industry, so about 7 billion chips a year go out with our technology on, but uh, it's moving upstream rather quickly. So conditional access is an area. Uh, Broadcom and Marvell have uh, both uh, licensed this technology from us, uh, one instantiation in a core. So we're actually providing cryptographic cores that have these DPA countermeasures on top of them so that they can be integrated into SOCs and delivered very, very effectively. Uh, ultimately, of course, we believe this will go into every device. Um, the most pressing today is the mobile phone because, of course, as you look out in the future, uh, mobile phones, I, at least I believe, will be used as a payment device very near for, uh, term. I know uh, technologies like NFC have taken a long time to develop. Maybe it won't be that implementation, 
uh, well, Google Wallet was, I think most people would believe, not a great success. Uh, on the other hand, I think that it's still going to be the preferred technology. And moreover, for enterprises, um, we can take almost any phone that exists today uh, that doesn't, isn't protected by our DPA technology, and we can take a key out of it in less than 24 hours. Not that we do that as a business model, although economically it would be very interesting to do that, but it's also uh, the, the, the black hat side of it that we, we, we wouldn't do. But but engaging the industry to provide this class of technology I think is, is going to be important. Um, last but not least is something we announced recently out of our labs initiative. In, and this is a binary pixel imaging. There's a whole set of capabilities that it has, but in the simplest instantiation, we basically do temporal oversampling. So you can think about it as every time the, the technologies are, um, or every time the, the pixels are filled up, we actually put a little counter so we can allow it to get more dynamic range. Today, fo uh, most of the, the cameras that use it actually take two or three pictures and then uh, under different um, conditions, munge together to get a broader dynamic range. We can do that through architectural twists. We um, are, this is actually something run through the simulator based on the chip, the test chip that we have. And if you came up and saw it more clearly, you, you, you really have removed all of that light and dark and you've gotten a much more even tone and much wider uh, dynamic range. I think uh, this class of technology, which can be implemented on conventional CMOS imagers, could also be very interesting to the, the, the industry. So. What does this all mean as I come back on topic here and stop the commercial for Rambus? Uh, the first is that extremely high quality semiconductor IP is critical for the industry. Critical. It's not just important. Before it was important. Today, I think it is more than important. It's critical. The companies that create it are going to fare well. Those that don't, I, I think, are going to die. I think first time right silicon uh, IP is going to be so critical for the industry that if you are not in that poll leadership position, you should not continue to uh, fo focus on that segment. And that's because mistakes don't cost a couple hundred thousand. They cost enough that it could bankrupt your customer or your, your company. And um, when you source it, this is not going to be uh, a simple decision. It's going to be one of these make or break it decisions that, that wasn't the case before, let's be honest. 